So the way this talk is going to work is I am going to present code on the slides. Now, the slide is only so big, so I can't necessarily put the entire code sample up there, but I'm going to put the most relevant part to what we're talking about here. So if you copy the code directly from the slide, it might not do everything we're talking about. What I do have for you, though, is I'm going to give you the slide link at the end, and um, I can give it to you earlier on, too, as well. Um, I don't have the slides I'm using today posted uh, because I, of course, tweaked them last night and this morning, <laughs> so I can't ever leave my slides alone. Uh, but I do have the full code from the application up online so you can download it and look at the full code later. But on the slides, we're just putting a small section of the code up. Um, also, big important thing here is this code is just for teaching purposes. This is not good code to use in a live environment. It is not secure. It is not efficient. It is merely just to give you guys examples to get you started. So don't think you can take this code and go put it on a website and start using it. Um, it's merely for playing with. Um, oh, and the last thing on there was, feel free to ask questions at any time. This is all about you guys learning PHP. So if you have questions, raise your hand, interrupt me. I don't mind being interrupted at any time. <coughs> Whatever you're wondering about it, ask right away so you don't forget what your question was. So who am I? I am Beth Tucker Long. I work for PHP Architect Magazine, and I also run my own consulting firm. So I'm a freelancer. I'm also a stay-at-home mom. You'll see my husband and my son running around out in the lobby. <laughs> And I'm also a user group leader. So speaking of user groups, if you're not involved in your local user group, a user group is an excellent way to learn about PHP. PHP community has a very strong network of user groups. So take a look. Here are some suggestions for places where you can find user groups. If you don't have a user group in your area, uh, Nomad PHP is a user group that meets online. So as long as you have an internet connection, you can be in the user group. They have excellent speakers every month. Otherwise, check out php.usergroups, which is php.ug is the URL. Or um, if you're in the US, meetup.com is a very popular place for user groups. Or php.net will also list the user groups. It's generally in the right-hand menu bar, although they've been tweaking the design. So it wasn't in the menu bar last week, but I think it's back this week. Um, otherwise, if you check the calendar on php.net, user group meetings are listed there. If there's not a user group in your area, then you should start one. Um, you feel free to email me. I would love to help you start one. It's not as hard as it sounds, but it is a long-term commitment because it takes about a year before you can really get a solid group started and moving. So be prepared to commit perhaps to being the only attendee for a few months while things get rolling. But we would love to help you get started. It's also a good idea to get involved. Everyone's here at a conference. That's wonderful. Some other places you can get information are Day Camp for Developers does... Um, sort of day-long training sessions as well. Uh, PHP Architect, where I work, we have a summit series. We also do training. ProTalk, so if you go to protalk.me, they catalog talks from speakers and slides and things like that. So you can um, find videos of talks on various topics. Another great resource for learning at home. And Joined In is going to give you a lot of information about where you can find conferences, where you can find user groups as well. And as I said, I, I will be posting these slides, and I, do, um, I will have them posted online. I'll probably try to do it during one of our breaks, um, which is another thing. If you guys need a break, just let me know. Um, I'm happy to take a break anytime. So a place you can go if you have questions would be IRC. PHP is very active in IRC. So check out, um, generally on Freenode, if you go to hash hash PHP, or PHPC is the community channel. Um, PHP is the help channel, and the community channel is for more general discussion, whereas if you, if you have a question like you're struggling with a bug or you can't figure something out, I would recommend starting in the help channel. Um, the community channel is very friendly, but it's not necessarily meant as a help channel. So those are two places you can check. There's also a web chat. If you're not familiar with using IRC, you can just go to webchat.freenode.net and use that interface to ask questions on IRC. So that will get you in. You can also ask on Twitter. PHPC has a Twitter handle. You can tweet to that. There's also a PHP community on Facebook where you can ask questions. And you can always come to the PHP Architect site on Facebook as well to ask questions. 
And if you're looking for current news, phpdeveloper.org aggregates news items, blogs, and things like that, all related to PHP. And they do a great job putting out um, a really interesting feed of what's going on in PHP. If you're looking for online training, as I said, we do online training, but also Code Academy does online training as well for PHP. So if you're looking for some place to go and play around with what you're learning here today, those are some sites you can go to. And now down to the nitty gritty, let's get started. So we have PHP and HTML can be in the same file. And I'm gonna try not to walk in front of the slides, but it is kind of a habit of mine to walk in front of the slides. So let me know if I'm standing in front of what you're trying to read. So HTML and PHP can exist in the same file. So we have opening and closing tags to tell the HTML when to stop and PHP to start, and then when we're gonna go back to regular old HTML. So you can see here we have an angle bracket, question mark, PHP, that's our opening tag. That is called the standard opening tag. There are other kinds of tags you can use to open and close PHP, but this is the only one that's generally enabled by default on servers. So if you're not sure what kind of server environment you're going to be using, we strongly recommend you use the full opening tag. Additionally, there can be some confusion because XML also uses the angle bracket question mark, and so if you don't use the full PHP, there can be some confusion about what you're using. You see here we're declaring a variable, and I'll go over that in a second. We're echoing something out, which is gonna display it to the browser. And you'll notice that we can use HTML code right in our echo statement. So you can use HTML right in your PHP. And then we have a closing tag, and we're right back into plain old HTML. So as I said, regular HTML. Then we have our opening tag. This is what the short opening tag looks like. And then we have our PHP code. Now, we declared a variable. Variables in PHP start with a dollar sign. So the dollar sign lets you know that you're declaring a variable name. The name has to have, um, can contain letters, numbers, and underscores. So no hyphens, no periods, no spaces. Those are big gotchas that happen a lot. Um, and it has to start with either a letter or an underscore. So you cannot start a variable in PHP with a number. So you can't name your variables one, two, and three. You can name them, however, A, B, and C. Although I recommend using something a little bit more meaningful than that because if you're sharing code with other developers or it's been two months since you've looked at the code and you're going back in, it can be very difficult to remember what you know, variable X was or variable L. PHP is loosely typed which means that you don't have to declare if it's a string or an integer, et cetera, before you create the variable. PHP will guess what you're trying to use. Now, sometimes this is very handy, sometimes it's not. There are ways to sort of force PHP to use certain types, but that's a little bit more advanced and we're not gonna cover it today, but there are ways to do that. Um, we assign a value using the equal sign. So you declare your variable name, have an equal sign, and then whatever value you want to assign to it. And then we end the line with a semicolon. Echoing things out, as I said, sends it to the browser. So if you want something to display in the browser window or on whatever um, display screen you're using. So we'd say echo. I have it double quotes around it and a semicolon at the end. And you'll see that the HTML code comes through, the variable is replaced, and then there goes on. Quoting strings, there are a couple of different ways to quote strings. So we can use double quotes. That is going to allow everything inside that to be replaced or interpreted. So if you use variable names, et cetera, it will all be replaced. Now you'll notice here, I have some stuff highlighted in red there. It's a backslash and then double quotes. Now because we're using double quotes to note the beginning and the end of our string, if we wanna have double quotes inside our string, we need to escape them. And so the backslash is going to be the escape character, which will allow that double quote to be just a normal double quote character and not the end of our string. Also, um, if we want to display a backslash then, if there's a space after it, you can just have a backslash. However, if you're doing something like, we want to have some instructions on how to put the, the code in. So we actually want it to print a dollar sign and then the word dir name. We don't want it to be uh, replaced as a variable. So we put a backslash in front of that dollar sign. Now the backslash in front then is going to be just read as a regular backslash and the second one is going to escape the dollar sign. Single quoted is called string literal. 
string literal is going to print every character exactly as you've typed it out. It's not going to replace any variables. It's not going to look for any escape strings except for the backslash in front of a single quote. That is the only thing it's going to look for. So we have single quote here to open it. This is going to print dollar sign name. It is not going to be replaced as the variable. And then you can see here we have to escape that single quote because we don't want to end our string. And then it will end at the end. Now, because it's string literal, we don't need to do the double backslash in front of the dollar sign. The dollar sign will not be escape, will not be replaced, so we don't need to escape it if you want it to actually print out the dollar sign. Any questions so far? Am I going way too fast, way too slow? Anyone have any comments yet? If you keep being quiet, I'm just going to come up with more questions to ask you. So, all right. So another way to quote strings is called here doc. Here doc looks a little strange at first, but it can be very, very helpful. Now what happens is with here doc is we start our echo, and then to begin our string we have three angle brackets and then my string. Now my string is just a keyword that I created. It can be any keyword that you want. And I put them all in capitals just because I think it makes it stand out more, but you don't have to. So I have it all in capitals. And then my actual quoted string begins on the next line. Then I can quote whatever I want. Notice I don't have to escape any double quotes or single quotes. My variables are going to be replaced and interpreted. To end the here doc, I start on a brand new line. I say the keyword again and then put a semicolon and then my code, the rest of my code begins on the next line down. So with here doc, after your keyword, you put a hard return, start on the next line. And then when you repeat the keyword to close the here doc, that has to be the first thing on the line. So no white space in front of it. And after the semicolon, there shouldn't be anything else after it. You go down to the next line to start any future code. Now, as I said, this seems kind of strange. But what's great about it is that you don't have to escape double quotes and single quotes. But you still get variables interpreted and replaced. It's also really nice because if you have a really long block of text, or if you have a lot of blocks of text in your code, this allows you to put a keyword to start and end the block of code. So you can kind of label what these blocks of code are, or these strings are. There's also, if you're using 5.3 or greater, there's now doc, which is the string, little, string literal version of here doc. So again, what we do here is it's exactly the same, except that our keyword has single quotes around it. So that's the only change you have to make. And now, the variable name will not be replaced. It'll print out dollar sign name. Okay. Now, why would you ever want to use that? Well, string literals, if you're really, really concerned about speed, string literals are going to be a little bit faster to run because they're not going through and looking for variables to interpret and replace. They're not looking for those escape characters. So they're doing less. So if you need to do something and you're very concerned about speed, string literals can be a little bit, a little bit quicker. The last thing we talked about in our first example there was the closing PHP tag. Now, the closing PHP tag is optional. And the reason it's optional is because PHP will automatically end when the script ends. So you don't have to worry about putting that in unless you want to go back to HTML before the end of your script. Now, some people recommend that you never put a closing PHP tag in. Other people recommend that you always put it in. So there are two very different camps on this. The main difference is if you put in a closing HTML tag and you are not very careful about the trailing white space at the end of your file, you can cause some bad consequences for someone else, especially when you get into dealing with like cookies and things that affect the browser headers. Trailing white space in a file is considered HTML, so it will send the browser header. So even though it doesn't look like anything else is in that file, to a browser there is, and it will send the headers, and it could cause an error if someone's trying to um, modify cookies and things like that after your file is included. So that would be why you would want to be careful about putting closing tags in. So if you're very careful about your white space at the end of your file, you can put in a closing HTML tag. Otherwise, feel free to leave it out. Now our echo statement, as I said, you can put HTML right into your echo statement. So HTML is how we're going to format the code that we're, or the content that we're echoing out. So you see we can put P tags in, the line breaks, italics, etc. Now, there are two different ways to echo. 
And you may see Sprint as well. So Sprint is not recommended anymore. Um, Echo is the standard. So there's a couple different ways you can Echo in HTML. The way we just showed on the left side where you have an Echo statement on all the HTMLs inside. If you want to Echo out just the part that you need interpreted by PHP, what you can do is we can say P tag welcome. And then we have our opening PHP tag. We Echo out just the variable name close PHP, and we're right back into HTML. So you can go back and forth multiple times right in the same sentence. You can just hop in and out. If you have 5.4 or greater for PHP, you can also use the short tag configuration, it's called. So here, instead of PHP echo name closing tag, we can just say angle bracket question mark equals what we want to echo out and then the close of the tag. So it's a little bit quicker. So if you ever see that, that's just the shorthand for what's up in the above example. So comments are very important in code, not only to help other developers with understanding what you've done, but even for you to go back years later and figure out what you did previously in your code. There are three different ways to make a comment. The top and the bottom are going to be the most common ones you see. So the top one is two forward slashes, and then everything on that single line is a comment. So you can type whatever you want in there. PHP will ignore it completely. Again, the hash you could use as well. It's a single line comment. If you want to have a multi-line comment, you use a forward slash and then an asterisk. And then that everything will be a comment until you have asterisk forward slash to close it. This you'll actually see very commonly in a lot of files because a lot of the documenting programs use this as their standard. So, for instance, PHP Documenter and things like that. What you'll see then is you see a forward slash asterisk, and then they start their comment. And then the next line will have a space asterisk, so the asterisks line up, and then their comment. Those asterisks are nice because it makes it really obvious that you're still in a comment and it's easy to read. They're not required, though, by PHP. But you will see that very commonly in a lot of files. We're going to pause just for a second to talk about good coding practices. If you're just getting into programming, I recommend you take a look at one of the coding standards because now is the easiest time to learn a coding standard as opposed to a couple years from now when you've acquired all sorts of terrible habits and then you have to try to break them. So start now. Take a look at a coding standard. Pick one out. If you are working for a certain employer, find out if they have a coding standard that you should be learning and go with that. Um, what the coding standards do is the coding standards give you sort of an outline for how much indentation you should use where you put spaces in your code, how you comment your code, and things like that. They're generally not too onerous to use. It's generally pretty straightforward kind of common sense things. But as I said, it's really easy to start while you're learning. It's really hard to break those habits once you've gotten used to doing, it, doing things a certain way. Um, and here's a link to PHP Documenter, which goes through and talks about the commenting, uh, commenting standards and things that I discussed with the comments. PHP can do math for you, which is always fun. So addition is just the plus sign. So we can say A equals A plus 3. And the reason we can do that is because PHP will parse and interpret everything on the right side of the equal sign before assigning it back to the variable on the left. So you can use a variable in its own definition. The shorthand for addition as well is A plus equals 3. That's shorthand for the top line there. And if you want to just increase by 1, you can do A plus plus. Subtraction is the same way. You just replace the plus sign with a hyphen or a minus sign. So we have A equals A minus 3, A minus equals 3, or A minus minus. Multiplication is the asterisk. And again, A, a star 2 or asterisk 2 or asterisk, asterisk equals 2. Division, again, A forward slash 2 or A slash equals 2. We don't have an A star star or an A forward slash forward slash because that would always be the same number. So, well, perhaps not always, but in general. So. Okay, so let's get into actually making something that does something for us. So we're going to make a pizza order form. I apologize doing this before lunch. So we're going to order, uh, have an order form. We're going to take in the customer name, the size of the pizza. We're going to allow them to order multiple toppings. And then we're going to give them a printable receipt that they can print out. So this is the application we're going to make today. So this is what our order form is going to look like. So it's pretty simple. We're going to have a text box for the name. We're going to give them radio buttons for the sizes. We're going to give them check boxes for the toppings and a button at the bottom. To go through that, we have our form tag. 
Now, in the action field, if you're not familiar with forms, action field is where we're going to put the name of the file that we want it to send the data to when the form is submitted. It can be the same file that you're currently in. And then method, there are two different types of methods, post and get. What post does is it sends the information in the headers. Get will send the information in the URL. Now, you will hear that post is more secure than get. That is only kind of true. What will happen is with post, because it's sending it in the headers instead of the URL, if somebody copies the URL and sends it to their friend saying, hey, order pizza from this place, all their information isn't in the URL. So that is ever so slightly more secure. However, the information when it's set by post is not encrypted, it's in plain text, it's easily sniffable through the browser, so it is not secure. I just, I just like to clarify. So our text field, pretty basic text field, input type equals text, we're gonna assign it a name. When the data goes into PHP, whatever we put in that name field is the variable name we're gonna get from PHP for it. So it's good to assign unique names for everything. Our radio button's the same way, the name is going to be what comes into PHP, and the value is gonna be what is passed in. With checkboxes, again, like I said, name, and the value is what is passed in, similar to the radio button. And our input field, now even the input field is gonna come into PHP. So assign that a name as well and a value. You can do it without that, it'll still work in HTML, even if you don't, it will still submit the data. But it's really nice when it comes into PHP if we know which submit button the data was sent by. So this gives us some information about where the data came from. So assigning that a name, that will come in as well. It's also good to note too, whenever data comes in from a form in PHP, whether it's checkboxes, radio buttons, text boxes, however it is, all of that data comes into PHP as a string. So even if it's numbers, whatever it is, it's coming into PHP as a string. So just one thing to keep in mind as data comes in from, from forms. So what we're gonna get in PHP is called a super global. Now the super global is an array. So what an array is, is an array is a variable that holds other variables in it. So we're gonna start with, again, our dollar sign because our variables always start with the dollar sign. And then underscore post is the name that PHP automatically creates if you use post as your submission type. It will be underscore get if it comes in via get. Then we have square brackets and then our field name. So for instance, our name field on the form, we gave that the name cusp name in, in the name parameter. That's where this is gonna go. So we'd have dollar sign underscore post cusp name is going to hold the cusp, whatever they've typed into the customer name field on our form. Now arrays, as I said, um, hold other variables. So you can see here, variable, this is our array name. So everything that comes in from the form is gonna start with underscore post. And then in the square brackets, that's the data that's going to change. There are two kinds of arrays in PHP and you can create them yourself. PHP automatically creates the super globals for us, but you can use arrays as well. There are enumerated arrays, which are going to have numbers for the keys. The keys are what's in the square brackets. Or you can create associative arrays, which are gonna have a string as the key. So you can have array items zero, one, two, three, or array items, first name, last name, et cetera. So depending on what you're using it for, you may want a more descriptive label on it. It's important to note that enumerated arrays start with zero. So the very first array item is going to be item zero. So something to keep in mind, if you start with one, you're not getting the first item. So it's a little bit, little bit tricky at first, but you get used to it. With associative arrays, if you start with an associative array, and then you assign an item to it without assigning it a string key, it will, PHP will automatically assign it a number. So it, you can have, excuse me, you can have an array that is both enumerative and associative in the same array. I will say that it won't always be the number that you think it might be. So don't expect it to be zero when you, if you started out with, um, if you started out associative, but it generally is. So built-in functions, PHP has a number of built-in functions that you can use. So you don't have to create them, they're automatically there. And the way you call them is you say function name, and then there's 
parentheses afterwards, and you can pass in any parameters that that function needs. So we have a function to help create arrays. It's called array. So what we're going to do is we're going to assign the array a name. So I just called it array name. And then we say equals array. And then we pass in a comma separated list of all of the items we want added to that array. So I just call them first value and second value. That's going to create an array with first value as item 0 and second value as item 1. If we want to add items to it in the future, we can just say array name and put empty square brackets so it'll automatically assign it the next highest number and then put the value that we want to assign there. Now, with PHP being loosely typed, there is a shortcut for this. What you can do is you can skip this top one and just say array name, square brackets, and put a value. A PHP will look at that and say, oh, I think they're trying to create an array. I'll create it for them and assign that value to it. So you don't have to explicitly create the array before you start using it. To echo out the information, we say echo array name and then square brackets there. And I didn't use quotes there um, around the echo, and I'll get into that in just a second. Now, associative arrays are just a little bit different, but not too, not too much different. So let's say we want to assign a key and a value. So here we have our customer info. We're again using the array function. And now this time, though, we're specifying a key first, so our key is going to be first name. And then we use what's called the array pointer. The array pointer is an equal sign and then um, a right angle bracket. And so we say last name pointer Tucker Long or first name pointer Beth. And so the first item is going to be the key. The second item is going to be the value that's assigned to that array item. Again, we can use the shortcut of cust info Twitter handle and that is my Twitter handle there. And echoing it out, again, we say cust info and then we just put the key in there as well. Now, quoting arrays is a little bit different. Because they're not a standard variable type, what we need to do is treat them just a little bit differently. So we can echo first item post zero. That's going to work because PHP is going to look at that and say, oh, I think they're trying to quote an array, and they will echo that out for us. However, that doesn't always work because PHP is going to be greedy when defining the variables before it interprets and replaces them. So if you have information after post zero that might look like more array information to PHP, it's going to keep going, and then it's going to say it can't find the array item you're looking for. So if we want to be explicit about what is our array item to make sure that PHP is doing exactly what we want, you can put curly brackets around it right in your echo statement. So you can see curly bracket, or you can use the concatenation operator to concatenate it onto your string. And the concatenation operator in PHP is a period. So what that'll look like here in a post is we have echo. We're using double quotes so that everything will be interpreted and replaced. You can see here for cus name, I put in curly brackets. Those curly brackets are not going to display. It's just defining the beginning and the end of that array variable for PHP. To concatenate it on, we have a closing double quote to end our quoted string, concatenation operator. And then we put another concatenation operator, and that just glues that PHP or the key tag onto the end there. Now, arrays can be nested, so you can have arrays inside of arrays. There's no limit to how deep you can go. So we have our post. Here's our array, cust info. And then you'll see after the pointer, I'm putting another array, and that's where I'm putting the first name and last name. To get access to those deeper levels of the array, we just keep putting square bracket sets after our post until we get down to the level we want. So in our case here, we have post. We have our customer info, and then we're going to the last name field inside the customer info array. So as I said, you just keep putting square brackets for the item you want as you go deeper into the array nest. So here's what we are currently getting from our post from our form. So we're getting a customer name, pizza size, pizza status, and we're getting mushrooms, extra cheese, green peppers, pepperoni, black olives, and sausage. Okay? That's kind of a silly list of toppings because every time we want to have a new topic, topping, we have to create a new variable for it and use a new variable. So we want to simplify this a little bit. And remember when I told you that PHP will guess that you're using an array? Well, they'll do it when it's coming in from a form as well. So in our form, so in the HTML, we can say pizza toppings and put empty square brackets after it. 
And when that data is sent into PHP, PHP will see that, and it will make that a nested array inside of our post array. So it will automatically make it an array for us as it comes in. So this is what we are getting now. We are getting our post array. We are getting three items in our post array, test name, pizza toppings, and pizza size. Inside pizza toppings is another array, and it's going to give us whatever choices that they've checked off in that array. To display arrays, if you just echo the array, so if we echo dollar sign underscore post, it's just going to echo out the word array. So if you're ever looking for your data and you're just getting the word array, it's because um, you're echoing the top of the array instead of one of the array items. So if we want to see everything that's in the array, we can use print R, which is a recursive print. And what that's going to do is go through each item in the array. It's first of all going to tell us it's an array, and then it's going to give us the key, the pointer, and then the value. Another way you can do that is with variable dump, <laughs> variable dump or var dump. This is going to give you a little bit more information. So it's going to give you array, a number of items in the array, and it's going to tell you a little bit more information about the values in the array. So here it's telling us it's a string, seven characters long, and so on. So that gives you a little bit more information. Now this is great for you as a developer, but this is not how we want to show this data to the customer. So we can use loops to go through the data. <coughs> so what we can do is count is a, a built-in function. It's going to count how many items are in the array for us. So that's one of PHP's built-in functions. We're going to assign a counter. I, I use n because all the examples on php.net use n, so I just got used to using n, but you can use any variable you want. So I assign it to zero, and now while is a loop that's going to run as long as the condition is true, it will keep running. So I'm saying as long as n is less than the count for pizza toppings, because we don't know how many pizza toppings they're going to choose. So we're going to count how many they've sent in. So let's say they send in three. Now, n is starting at zero, which is less than three. So it's going to echo out pizza toppings. And notice I'm doing post, then pizza toppings, then n. Because arrays start at zero, and n is starting at zero, that's going to give us the first item. Then I increase n by one. And now it's going to go back up and do this um, condition again. So now n is one. One is less than three still. So it's going to run this again. It's going to give us item one. And then it's going to increase this to two. Two is still less, so it's going to run again. And then it's going to be three. Now three is not less than the count. Three is equal to our count. So it's not going to run this again. It's going to come down and continue the code after the closing curly bracket. Um, one of the very common problems with loops is you forget this line down here. So it's important to make sure that you have some way of changing your counter. Otherwise, your loop will run forever. It's called the infinite loop problem, and your server will eventually get tired of running it and crash. So you want to make sure you're not running infinite loops. Another type of loop that we can do is the do loop. The do loop is exactly like the while loop, except that it runs the code first and then tests the condition. So in this case, we have n equals 0. It's going to give us the 0 item. And then it's going to check if 0 is less. Well, in this case, it incre increments it first. So it's going to check if 1 is less. Now, this can be good if you want to ensure that your code is always run at least once, because the condition is not checked until after. However, if, let's say, n was 4, and we only had three items in our array, it's going to run this and display nothing because there is no fourth item, then check that four is not less than our count, and then continue running. So you can run into a situation where you're running code that isn't going to work. But as I said, if you want to make sure that your code is always run at least once, you can use a do loop. Mm -hmm. No, no, sure. It actually won't get to four. Um, so it starts at zero. It runs the code, but it turns to one here. So the first, the first time we check it, we're checking it at one. So we're not checking it at zero. So then the second time it goes through, it's one, increases to two, then test. And then two is going to run. It's going to increase it to three, and it's going to stop, because three won't pass our test. Nope. 
we're getting 0, 1, and 2, which are our three items in our array. And then when n increases to 3, this condition will fail and it'll stop. You mean the, the left end here? Yeah. Yeah, two loops, because you're evaluating, you're doing the code first and then evaluating the condition, you have to sort of think of it a little bit backwards. Um, but because it's incrementing n before we test, it, it'll still stop in time. So, yeah, good question. Now, remember I talked about the infinite loop error. Infinite loops are really obnoxious. So there is a for loop that can help prevent your infinite loop. So what a for loop does is it takes that creation of the counter, creation of the condition, and the modifying of the counter and puts it all into the um, parameters at the top here. So here we, you can see we have four, and then we have the opening parentheses, n equals zero. That's our, our counter creation. That will only be run once the first time this loop runs. Then we have a semicolon, and then we have our condition. n is less than our pizza toppings count. Okay? So that's going to be run every time the loop runs. And then we have another semicolon, and then we have our counter modification, which is the n plus plus. Now what will happen is that's exactly the same as the while loop we did before, but everything is now in those parentheses, so you won't forget it. When you're dealing with arrays, you can also use a for each loop, which is specifically for arrays. So we have for each, and then we list our array. So we want to go through the pizza toppings, and then we say as, and we define a variable that we're going to use inside of our for each loop. So I just said as topping. You, again, again, you can name it any valid var variable name. Now what happens is inside of our loop here, I'm echoing out and I'm using that topping variable. So every time this loop runs, the next item in the array will go into that variable name. So the first time I go through, it'll get mushrooms, the second time black olives and so on, whatever they've chosen. If we also want to have the keys as well as the values, we can say for each, and we have our posts as, and this time we assign two variables. So we give it a key variable, then we have the pointer, and then a value variable. And again, you can name those whatever you'd like. And then you can use them inside the, the code in between the opening and closing curly brackets here. Yeah, absolutely. It's for, for each array as variable name. And then this one is for each array as key name pointer va variable name. Okay, so in our case, in our code, for us to display the pizza toppings, we're going to use a for each because we just we don't need the keys. We just need the um, we just need the value. So we're doing for each pizza toppings as topping. We're going to echo this out. However, let's say we want those toppings to be in alphabetical order. So what we can do is we can sort our array first. Now sorting has a couple of gotchas that we're going to go through. So here we have, let's say we have a list of images, and we want to display them in order for someone to um, go through and view the images. So our images are 1, 20, 5, 10, and 3. That's not a good order to display them in. So what we're going to do is we're going to say sort pictures, and then we're going to, I'm just using print R here, but obviously if we were displaying it to a real customer, we'd, we'd do something a lot nicer. So here you can see we're getting 1, 10, 20, 3, 5. So not quite what we were hoping for. Anyone know why it does that? Right, it's interpreting the numbers as a string. So what it's doing is it's going through, and normally when you alphabetize things, you look at the, you alphabetize the first letter, and then if anything has the same first letter, you go to the second and so on. So what it's doing here is it's getting to, okay, they both have one, but this one has a zero, so it has extra, so it's going to go after, because it has this one and it's shorter. So it's alphabetizing them as a string, which is not what we want. So if you're using 5.4 or higher, you can use what's called the sort natural flag. And what we do is we say sort pictures, comma, and we just add in sort natural. What that's going to do is sort it as a human would sort it, not as a computer would sort it. And so now you'll see that we get it 1, 3, 5, 10, 20. So it's going to read those numbers as numbers, not as a string. Yeah. 
Now, here we have places. Without the sort natural flag on places, you'll notice we have Greece, Malaysia, US, Uganda. Now, US should not come before Uganda. However, to a computer, a capital S comes before a lowercase g in the alphabet because a computer alphabetizes by capital letters then by lowercase letters. However, that's not how we want it to display to our customers. So again, using that sort natural flag will put the lowercase letters on the same ranking as the uppercase letters. All right, sorry, my microphone's sliding down there. Okay. Now, one other thing, though, is if you use sort, you lose your keys. We don't always want to lose our keys. So, for instance, here we have a list of winners. First place was blue, second place was green, third place was purple. If we just use sort on that, you'll notice it's nicely sorted, but we've lost who was first, second, and third place. So to keep our keys, there's a couple different kinds of sort you can use. And the first one is the associative sort. So it's just a sort. And you'll notice now it sorts by the value, but we keep our keys. In our case, though, we want a list of winners. So we want to sort actually by the keys, not by the values. So in that case, we can use k-sort. k-sort is, again, going to keep our key value pairs, but gives us alphabetically by the key instead of by the value. Um, and we're about an hour in, so if people would like, um, would like to take a quick break, or do you want to keep going? Break. Excellent. Okay, so take a break. Feel free to come up and ask me questions, run to the bathroom, grab a drink, whatever, and then um, we'll come back, um, let's say, 10 minutes. So now we've talked about displaying the information and sorting things, but now we need to start making some, some um, decisions with our code. So what we're going to do is, when someone comes to the order form to order a pizza, and then we give them the printable receipt, obviously we don't want to display the order form on their printable receipt. And we don't want to display the printable receipt until they're done ordering. So we want to sort of make a decision here about what we're going to display to them based on what stage they are in the process. So our, we are going to use some comparison operators to find out where we are in the process. Now, when you compare two things in PHP, two equal signs will check if the value of the two items is the same. Now, if you need to check if the value and the data type is the same, then you want to use three equal signs. Now, if you're going to check is not the same, you replace one of those equal signs with an exclamation mark. You don't just put an exclamation mark in front, it actually replaces one of those equal signs. So if the value is not the same, would be exclamation mark equal sign. If the value and data type are not the same, that would be exclamation mark and two equal signs. Now, why is it important to check the value and the data type? Well, there are certain functions in PHP. For, for instance, there's one called string position. Now, string position is going to tell you where something is in a string. So let's say I have the sentence, the quick brown fox, and I want to know where the word brown is. It's going to tell me that it's at position four. Now, if I'm looking for the word the, it's going to tell me it's at the first position, which, when PHP is counting, that's position zero. So it's going to give me back a zero. Now, if I'm just checking with two equal signs, it's, and I get back a zero, I don't know if that's a zero integer or a false, we couldn't find the word in the string. Because false can be represented by zero and true can be represented by any non-zero number. So what I'm going to need to do in that case is I need to check not only is it zero, but is it an integer versus is it zero and a Boolean false as far as data type. So in those kinds of situations, data type can be very important, and you'll want to make sure you're checking that as well. That's where the three equals sign comes in very, very much in handy. Um, less than and greater than um, are the common symbols for those. Adding an equal sign after it makes that less than and equal to or greater than and equal to, uh, greater than or equal to. We can combine our comparisons with logical operators. So two ampersands is going to be and, 
You can also write this as AMD. It doesn't have to be capitals. I put it in capitals just to emphasize it a little bit. Um, but you can use the word AND. However, the word AND is not 100% always going to get you what you expect. So I recommend using two ampersand when you're using your comparison. Same thing with OR. OR can be two pipe characters or the word OR. And again, the word OR may not always get you what you think you're getting. So I recommend always using the two pipe character. XOR is, means only one is true and one is false. So if you're comparing two things, one comparison is going to be true and one is going to be false. So XOR will then return true. If both items are true, XOR will return false. Um, with OR, both items can be true or one can be true and one can be false, and or will still return true. So it depends if one has to be false and one has to be true, then you would use the XOR. Let's get into some examples and see how this works. So we're going to use an if statement. If statements work very much the way they do in real life. If you clean your room, then you can go do this, so on. So we're going to say if pizza status equals place order. Now remember, pizza status is our submit button. This is where putting a, a name and a value on your submit button can become very useful. So we're checking if this pizza status is place order. Now the first time the page loads, the submit button has not been clicked. So pizza status is going to be empty. But once they click that submit button, it's going to contain the value that we assigned in our submit button. So it's going to contain place order. So we can kind of use that to gauge where they are in the process. So we're going to check if, and then curly bracket, around the code we're going to run. Now one thing that I do that's part of the coding standards that's not required, but you'll notice it in my slides, so I just want to mention it, is I have if space opening parentheses. But function names are the function name no space parentheses. That's part of the pair coding standards to help differentiate between con conditional statements and control statements versus function names. So you'll notice that in my code. That space is not required. You can have if, no space, and then the parentheses. So you'll see it both ways. And I just want to point out why I'm doing it this way on my slide. But you don't have to have a space there. If we'd like to have something that runs if the condition is false, we can add an else. So it will test the condition, pizza status equals place order. If that's true, it will run the first block of code. If it's false, it will run the else. The else will only be run if the condition is false. If the condition is true, it runs the first block of code and then exits out of the control structure. If we need to evaluate more than one condition, we can add an else if, because the else can never have its own condition. Else just runs if everything, if everything equates to false, then the else will run. You can never add a condition to the else. So if we need multiple conditions, we can have one if, as many else ifs as we want, and one else. And you can omit any of these steps except for the if. There, you always have to start with if, but you don't have to have else if, and you don't have to have an else. So you could have if and a whole bunch of else ifs and never have an else. It's up to you. So what happens here is the else if either needs to be on the same line as the closing curly bracket for the previous section or on one line below. But if you put two spaces between there, you're going to get an error message because PHP will break out of that control structure if you have an extra space in between there. Same thing with the else. On the same line as the closing curly bracket or on the line below, but nothing else in between there. So here you can see, again, if we have a condition, else if we have a condition, and then else has no condition. So what this means, and I apologize, this is kind of small. What this means for our pizza ordering form is we're going to say, if post pizza status equals place order, then we're going to give them a receipt. Else, we're going to give them the order form. Obviously, we want to do a few more checks than that, but we're just getting started here. Now, the first time that our code is run, we're going to run into this warning message. Warning, invalid argument supplied for for each. So what that means is we're trying to run our for each on pizza toppings. However, pizza toppings isn't an array because the people forgot to choose a pizza topping. So what's happening here is we're trying to run for each on a variable that's not actually an array. So that's what this error message means. So what we need to do is we need to make sure we have a, an array before we run the for each. And PHP 
has a built-in function called isArray. So is underscore array. So now we're going to say if isArray, then run the for each. Otherwise, so on. You can also check if the count is greater than zero. And even though PHP numbers the items in the array starting at zero, if there's one item in the array, the count will return one, because it's returning how many items are in the array, not the numbers, not the keys for them. So here's our corrected decision code. So we're going to say if post pizza toppings, and then we say if is array inside there. And you can nest your um, you can nest your array items. And you'll notice here too, I'm indenting my code. PHP doesn't care if you indent your code. PHP doesn't care if you put it mostly all on one line for the most part. Uh, here doc would be an exception to that. There's a few others. But this makes it a lot easier for you to read and a lot easier for other people to read. So that's why I'm doing it on the slide. So the way I have it structured is here's the if and there's the closing curly bracket for that if and so on. So now we want to make sure that the user has filled out the form correctly. So we're going to get into a little bit of validation here. So with our validation, for instance, for the customer name, we want to make sure they put a name in there. Now we don't really know what their name is going to be like. So we're going to be pretty simple in our validation here. So we're just going to make sure they type something in there. So we're going to check if the string length, so S-T-R-L-E-N is a built-in PHP function, string length, of the customer name is less than one character then we're going to give them an error message, please enter your name. And what I'm doing here is I'm creating an array called error messages with a square bracket, and I'm assigning it a value, please enter your name. So I'm going to store all of the error messages in that array item there. And I want to make sure that they've chosen at least one topping. So we're going to check if the count of pizza toppings is less than one, we're going to give them another error message. And again, we can just keep adding items to the error message array there because PHP will automatically assign it the next highest number. Now, when we're validating things, we do also want to be careful for malicious submissions as well. So because we're going to use this information and display it in the printable receipt, so we're going to display it back out in the browser, we want to make sure that we're not allowing characters to come in that could affect the display in the browser. So we're going to use a function called HTML entities. Now, HTML entities is not 100% accurate, but it's pretty good. And since we're only sort of concerned about security at this basic level here, we're going to we're going to use HTML entities, which is going to go through the submission, so our customer name, and make sure that any characters like angle brackets, quotes, and things like that are converted to their HTML code. So for instance, an angle bracket is going to be converted to ampersand LT semicolon or GT semicolon, which is still going to display in the browser, but isn't actually going to run any JavaScript if that's what they're trying to submit. So what we're trying to do here is just sort of ensure that they can't get any code through that's going to run when we display it back out to the browser. One thing to note here, pizza size. Now our pizza size was a choice of three radio buttons. That doesn't mean that the data that we get is one of the three options we provided. Anybody can write a script, post it to our form, and put in whatever data in that field they want. And they can see that field name in the source code of the HTML. So what we need to do is, even though we only gave them three options to choose from, we still need to make sure that the data we're getting in from that is correct. So even though, even though we gave them choices to choose from, we can't trust that that data is one of the choices we selected. So our pizza sizes were all, I think we're all one word and we're all alphabetic. So we can use a library called ctype alpha. ctype alpha is going to check pizza size. And if there's any non-alphabetic character in there, it's going to return false. So what we want to do here is we want to make sure ctype or that pizza size passes alphabetic. Now, alphabetic characters are uppercase A through Z, lowercase A through Z. So spaces, periods, hyphens, apostrophes, quotes, all of those are going to make it fail. So sometimes we want to, um, OK. Well, I'm missing a slide. I apologize. So <laughs> um, sometimes what you want to do is, Let's say we have one size 
let's say we do supersize, and that has a space in it. So we want to allow alphabetic characters plus spaces. What we can do is take a copy of pizza size, replace all the spaces with the letter A, and then run p-type alpha on it. Now again, you want to make sure you're doing that on a copy because we don't want to lose our real data. But that allows you to check then only spaces and alphabetic characters are being allowed through. For our array with pizza toppings, what we want to check here is that they've chosen a couple of pizza toppings and we want to make sure that it's only alphabetic characters and spaces because that's all that should be in those options. So there's a couple of different things we can do here. So first of all, we want to make sure it's an array. If it's an array, then we're going to run something called implode. Implode is going to take an array and convert it into a string. And what it's going to do is the first parameter that you pass in is called the glue. The glue is going to go in between each array item as it's converted into a string. So if they've chosen, let's say they've chosen mushrooms and black olives. So what's going to happen is we're going to get mushrooms a black olive as our string. Next, we want to convert spaces because we want to allow spaces. So we're going to run string replace. String replace is going to look for the first parameter, replace it with the second parameter in the third parameter. So it's going to look for spaces, replace them with the letter A in our check toppings variable that we created. Now we can run ctype alpha on it. And if it fails, we know that there's something else in there besides alphabetic characters and spaces in our array. And functions can be nested. In the first example here, I did them all in each individual step, so it's a little bit easier to see what's happening. But this line of code here, which wraps because the slide is not wide enough, but this line of code here does all of that in one. So if C type alpha fails on the string replace of the implode of pizza topping. So you can just keep nesting them. So you can use functions inside of functions. It does make it a little tougher to read, so if you're doing something really complicated, I recommend breaking it up just a little bit so you can put some comments in there about what's happening. But you don't have to. I'll see if that helps keep it over. Okay. Now, basic security, in my opinion, can be summed up with validate input, escape output. So everything that comes in, we're, we're validating to make sure that, you know, it's not empty. It's the right number of characters for what we want and so on. But don't try to protect every, for everything when it comes in. For instance, when you take data in from the form, don't escape it for databases and web display and mobile use and everything else you could possibly think of because you're going to miss something. But whenever you send that data back out, if you escape it for where it's going at that moment, you're probably going to be doing pretty well because you're always doing what needs to be done for what's happening to the data at that moment. So if you take the data in and then you're going to send it out to save it into a database, then what you want to do is escape it for the database. Now, when you bring it something back in from the database, you need to validate it again. Never trust even your own database. So validate that you're getting in some data that you want in. And when you send it out to the browser, you escape it for how the display is going to go in the browser. So again, validate when it comes into you. Always escape it for where it's going when you send it back out. Some common attacks you should be aware of. Cross-site scripting attacks are going to be people trying to get you to display their code on your site so that your users run that code and use it. Um, very common ones would be JavaScript. JavaScript having like a little link to go to a different page or a pop-up window, like a little alert pop-up window with a link to a bad website, those kinds of things. Um, Cross-site request forgery, that's going to be if someone comes to your site and they log in, and obviously we don't want to make them log in on every single page of our website. So we need some way to mark that they are logged in. So we pass a little variable in the background that says logged in equals yes. Now somebody else comes in and passes in that variable and says logged in equals yes, we need to know that that's not the same person that just logged in. And there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. You can take a browser fingerprint to try to tell if it's coming from a different browser and so on. Um, you can have them expire after a certain amount of time and force people to log back in and so on. So there's some things you can do, but that would be a cross-site request forgery. Something's coming in from a different site, but trying to impersonate somebody on our website. 
And then injection attacks are going to be people trying to inject data into your like SQL statements or MySQL statements and so on. So trying to inject something into your queries. Those are probably the three most common attacks. They are by no means the only attacks. Again, we are just covering basic security here. Um, a great place to start if you'd like to learn more about security would be the OWASP Top 10 Project. Every, every year they go through and talk about the top 10 attacks of the year. So it's a great resource to go through, learn about what attacks are very popular right now. You'll notice that a lot of the attacks from year to year are the same because people just still won't protect against these attacks. So please go take a look at the OWASP Top 10, make sure your projects protect against at least those top 10, if not more. Now, if we're going through our validation, obviously we could have a failure happen because if someone doesn't put in their, their first name or they don't choose a piece of topping or something, we need to handle what happens if they don't do that. So what we're gonna do is go through and give them some error messages. So remember, we were storing error messages in our array. So now what we can do is, in our form, we can just say, if error messages is an array, then run a for each and display the error messages in a list. Now, 90% of the time when something goes wrong on your form, it's not going to be a malicious attack. Users are very, very bad at filling out forms. They're very bad at reading directions. In fact, they won't read the directions. So always treat your users as though it were an accident. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but like 10 years ago, if you filled out a form wrong on the internet, you'd get a big screen that popped up and said, ha ha, I caught you, you can't attack my site. And it's like, but I just spelled it wrong. Like, and it would scare people a lot. Be nice to your users. Most of the time, it's an accident that they filled something out wrong on your form. So give them some nice error messages. Also, when you return the form, we want to make sure we give them the data that they filled out in the form. Don't make them retype in everything because that's just going to mean they're going to fill something else out wrong this time. So we want to make sure we give them the correct data. Okay. Um, so the way we do that is by refilling in the value. So what we can do is when we display the form, we can put in a value and say cusp name. That's going to fill in whatever we have in that cusp name variable. Now, the first time we run the form, that variable is going to be empty. PHP is not going to fill anything in because the variable is empty, so the field will display blank on the, on the screen. The next time that form is submitted, if we do have data in that variable, it will fill it in for us in the value. Radio buttons are a little bit different because we need to check the radio button. So we can put in a quick little if statement here. And notice I'm putting the if statement right in the middle of the input field. So input type equals radio, name equals pizza size. And then I just close out of our string that we're displaying there. I say if pizza size equals small, again, remember, two equal size, equal sign. Echo check, and then I go right back in. Now, if that if is false, it will not put checked, and it will just be an unchecked radio button. Now, array items are a little bit different because we can't just say if pizza toppings equals mushrooms. Because remember, if we just use pizza toppings without any array items, it's just going to give us the word array, which isn't helpful. So PHP has a handy function called in array. Looks very similar to is array. So if in array, and we say what we want to look for and where we want to find it. So if mushrooms is in pizza toppings, then echo check. Um, just an aside, if you want to refill text areas, we didn't have any in our form, but what you would do is just put the, the value or the variable in between the opening and closing text area tag. And for select boxes, we would echo selected with an if statement instead of checked, like the radio buttons and the check boxes. So that's how you refill those other two. Now what we can also do is highlight the fields. So let's say if in our error messages, we have an error fields array as well. Then what we can do is we can say, if in array, cuss name error fields, then we can echo out the error message, or we can assign it a class so that we can actually highlight that field and make it red. Um, highlighting the fields, bolding the text, somehow emphasizing that field means your users don't have to read the error messages at the top, and it makes it much more likely that they're going to be able to figure out what's going on and be able to fill it in. What we can also do, too, is 
if we don't want to have two separate arrays, we can simplify things and have error messages. We can put the field name as the key and the um, error message as the item. And then we can use array key exists. And so we can check if a certain value exists in the keys and then do our highlighting. Now we have a lot of redundancy in our code currently. So uh, this is obviously a very abbreviated form of the code we're using at this point, but we have, we're checking if post is place order, then we have all our validation tests and our error, and then if the error is passed, we have our form code here. Otherwise, if it was not submitted, then we have, and then if the ifs all pass, then we have our confirmation receipt. If the post is not place order, we have our form code here again. So we don't want to have to maintain multiple copies of the same code. So we can do that. So what we can do is build our own function. So here we have the keyword function. Then we have a function name that we've defined. Now function names follow the same naming rules as variables. So letters, numbers, and underscores can't start with a number, has to start with either a letter or an underscore. So here we have function, and I just named the function check if bad. And then we define what parameters we want to allow to come into our function. So I'm bringing in a field name. So I called it field name. Then we have opening and closing curly bracket. And inside my function check if bad, I am saying if the string length of the field name is greater than zero, and we want to check if the string position of post field name equals, um, again, string position, this is where we want to use the triple equal sign for string position. I think this code might be backwards. I think the equal sign has to come first in string position. David, do you remember? <laughs> Not to call you out, but um, PHP is notorious for um, what we call the needle and haystack inconsistencies. So sometimes, um, it's based on the phrase looking for a needle in a haystack. So what happens is needle is what you're looking for and haystack is where you're looking for it. And sometimes needle comes first and then haystack and other functions haystack is first and then needle. And I always have to look at the documentation. There's a few that I can remember, but um, so what we're trying to check here, is that correct? Okay, thank you. <laughs> like I said, I look at it and I always think, wait, was that supposed to be the other way around? Okay, so what we're looking for is we're looking for the string position in field name of an equal sign. Because let's say an equal sign is, obviously we don't want an equal sign in the name field. So that might be a sign to us that someone's trying to pass in some bad code. So we're gonna check that there are no equal signs. So we wanna make sure that if we run a string position of an equal sign, that it's returning false. And again, we're using three equal signs because if the equal sign is the first character and it returns zero, we don't want to confuse a zero with false, so we're using three equal signs. So we're checking to make sure there's no equal signs in our data. And then um, what we can do now is we can run check if bad on cust name. So customer name is gonna go into the field name, so it's gonna check post cust name for the length of it and for the equal sign. And then we can just run it a second time on pizza size and so on. Now, what I'm doing here with return false, return will end your function or your if and else and so on. So return, when you run it, false is what you will get if it gets to that return statement and then nothing after it will run. So what we're doing is if string position is true, it's gonna return true, else return false. Those, those will quit out. If the first if statement there is false, so it comes down to the else, it will return false and exit out of the function and give us that value. So return stops the processing of it and returns whatever you put after it there. So this allows us to, instead of having to check the string length and if there's any equal signs for cuss name and then do the same thing a second time for pizza size and have that same code over and over and over again to check these things, we can just create that function and now we just run the function for each one. And here you can see I'm checking if, check if bad, cuss name. So if that's true, which in our case, if it's true, that means something went wrong, then we're gonna have the error message for cuss name. 
Now sometimes in your if statements, you are gonna see what's called the ternary operator. What this does is we have our string position, we're checking for the equal sign, equals false. And then we just have a question mark and then a colon. And what that's doing is, if we go back a slide here, you can see, we have if string position return true, else return false. So those lines of code there are replaced by this ternary operator here. So you can see here, we're getting our result, and instead of saying if string position, then make it true, else make it false, we just use the question mark, then the if, like if it's returning true, it'll give us this first value. If it's returning false, it'll give us the second value after the colon there. So it is a little bit shorter to write out, but it can be a lot more difficult for people to follow. And I've seen people try to nest ternary operators. I don't like that. Just it, That makes it really, really hard to read. So we can also use a function to display our form. Now, a lot of people will tell you that you should never, ever put HTML code into a function. That should be separated out in the display. But for this example, we're going to do it because it reduces the redundancy in our code. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we have our function, display form. We're going to bring in three parameters this time, cusp name, pizza size, and pizza topping. And then we're going to put all of our form code in there. Then, whenever we want to use it, we just say display form, and we pass in the customer name is going to go into cusp name, pizza size is going to go into pizza size, and pizza toppings is going to go into pizza toppings inside of that. And then it will display that form code. So now we only have to update the form code in one place. So let's say we add another field called delivery address. We just have to go into our function, put in the new field, and it's going to be everywhere we need to use it now. Now, a quick note on scope for functions. Now, let's say we have a function called change number, and we're passing in a number, and then we're assigning that number five. So what's going to happen here is we have function change number. Let's say we have my number is 11. We run change number. So 11 is getting passed in. It's now being reassigned to five. Echo my number. That is going to echo 11. Because what's happening is the my number that's being changed inside the function only exists inside that function. So once we're back out of the function, PHP is using the my number variable that we created outside of the function. So if we wanted to actually change the value outside of the function, what we need to do is pass it in by called what's ref by reference. Normally it's passed in by value. So only the value 11 was passed in. A link to the actual variable was not. However, if we put an ampersand in front of it there, that's going to pass it in by reference. It's actually passing in a link to the outside or the external variable. So now we say my number equals 11. We run change my number. So now instead of just passing in 11 to our thing, it's passing in a link to our variable right here. So now we're going to update our variable to equal 5. Now when we echo my number, it's going to equal 5. So if you see an ampersand in front of it there, that's what they're doing. They're passing in an actual link to the variable as opposed to passing in just a value of that variable to the function. Now let's say we run this, and we have the number that we're passing in and the value we want to change it to, and the function is going to convert the variable to that new value. So we have my number. We run change number. Oh, we forgot to update this line with the new parameter we just added. You're going to get this error message here. Missing argument two for change number. So what this means is our parameter is missing. These parameters are required. As soon as you add another parameter to your function, it's required anywhere you call that parameter. So watch out for these error message messages. That what, that's what it means. So what you can do to simplify updates to your code is you can make a parameter optional. Optional parameters need to be last in the list of parameters, otherwise the f they'll never be optional because you could never skip the first ones. So we have function change number. We're passing in my number. Now we want to make change to optional. So what we're going to do is we're going to say change to equals 5. So if you pass in a value for change to, it'll be that value. If you don't pass in a value, it will be 5. This allows us now, we've added the parameter to our function so we can start using it, but we don't have to go back and find all of the code immediately because that code will all still work. 
So we have line number equals 11, change my number, we don't pass anything in, it's going to make it 5. If we run change number again and we pass in 7, it now update, updates it to 7 because we passed that in. A few more functions I want to cover just because they're really handy. So string to upper and you pass in the string, this is going to make it all uppercase. String to lower is going to make something all lowercase. Substring is going to give you a piece of the string. So you pass in the string, you pass in where you want to make the cut or where you want to start the cut and how long you want that cut to be. So let's say if we have the quick fox as our phrase, we're going to cut at position four and we're going to return five characters. That's going to give us the word quick. Remember again that this is position zero, kind of imagine like there's a cursor. So position zero, one, two, three, four. So it's going to make the cut here and then give us one, two, three, four, five characters after that cut. Now if you put a negative number for the second parameter, it's going to start at the back and come this way. So substring, the quick fox, negative three is going to start at the end and come back three and then cut. If you don't specify a length, it will just give you everything to the end of the string. Trim is very handy. It's going to trim out the white space at the beginning and the end for you. You can also use trim to trim out other things. If you pass in, there's some optional parameters for trim that you can pass in. And you can use it to clean up strings and things like that. So for instance, here we have someone, they put a bunch of spaces in the front. This is very handy, say, in like a, a username field because a lot of times people will accidentally put a space in the front of their username. So you can trim it off. Word count, string word count is going to tell you how many words are in the string that you pass in. Var dump, again we talked about var dump a little bit. It's going to give you the information. And what you can do here is we can do a var dump of the word count and it's going to give us not only the individual words, but it's going to give us um, how many characters long each of those words is. But again, that's not nice display, so that's just sort of a debugging thing. Um, you can pass in some other things into string word count as well. So let's say we have, um, we're going to pass in this sort of strange phrase there. And if we pass in zero for the second one, it's not going to count the numbers. It's only going to count the, <coughs> excuse me, the alphabetic word, so then we're going to get three because it's not going to count the 12 and the 45. Um, we can pass in zero, but we still want to count 45, and now we're going to get four. So you can get very specific about what you want to include in the word count and what you don't in case there are certain things that wouldn't necessarily be a standardly structured word, but you do want to include them. So we're up to the printable receipt. Um, we're now validating. We've done some basic security. So we want to give them a nice printable receipt. No header and footer graphics. So we need to go to a new page to get rid of the header and footer on our website. So what we need to do is that we need to have a way to save the information that we have and pass it to a new variable. So what, or a new page, I'm sorry. We can do that two different ways. Sessions and cookies. I mean, there's a lot more ways. The two we're going to cover are sessions and cookies. The difference between sessions and cookies are sessions are on the server side and cookies are on the client side. What that means is um, sessions, if you have a million people accessing your website, all of that data is being stored on your server. Just an ID is being passed to the user. Now if you have cookies, you have a million computers storing that data, which can be helpful. But cookies being on the client side means you can't trust any of that information coming from those cookies because cookies are just little text files on somebody's computer and they can modify them and mess them up. So there's a little bit of security concern, but you have more computers storing the data, and, and this is a very simplified, there are, are, it's a much more complicated explanation on the differences here, but so sort of the basics. Sessions are also less picky on header timing. Sessions, you start sessions at the top of your screen, and then you can use sessions throughout the script. Modify them, add to them, and whatever. Cookies, however, because they're stored on the client's computer, they are sent when the headers are sent in the browser. The headers are sent in the browser the first time anything happens that outputs things to the user. So any white space before your opening PHP tag, any white space after your PHP tag, any echo statements, any of those kinds of things. 
are going to send the headers before that happens. Once those headers are sent, the cookies are gone. They're on the user's computer. You can't modify them. So what we need to do is, if we're using cookies, we need to make sure we do everything we need to do with our cookies before we send the headers out to the browser. So timing is a little bit more tricky with cookies. However, both of them allow data to be stored so that you, ha you can set data on one script and then access that data and modify it and use it on a second script. So you don't have to pass it via another form with hidden fields and things. And we both get a super global array for them. So let's start with session. At the very top of our page, we want to say session start. That session start is going to set a cookie. It's going to give them an ID for their session, so their session ID. There is a, there is a way to do cookie list session. In that case, the session ID is passed as a get variable. Um, it's not recommended to do that anymore. Most people will accept cookies, and that's a much easier way to do it. But it is possible if you need to. Um, and, and there are more ways to handle it, too. But we're going to run session start. Now, this must occur before those headers are sent. But that's the only thing with sessions that needs to happen before the headers are sent. So just session start. So again, this needs to happen before any HTML at the top of the page, any white space at the top of the page, before you echo anything, anything that's going to send something out. Session start has to happen before that. Once we have run session start, we can now have access to the session super global. So dollar sign underscore session all in capital letters. We can add items to it. We can modify the items and so on. So in our script, we are going to add in a customer name, a pizza size, and pizza topping. Now, it is faster. What you could say is session data and just add the post variable. That's going to add the entire post array. However, if you see this in the code, this is a little bit of a security risk because then me with my malicious script coming in, I can put whatever I want in that post variable, and now you've added it all to the session. So you may want to go through and add in only your specific variables that you know you're using. Um, again, it doesn't mean that it's totally secure if you do it the other way, but just one more thing. Now when we want to use the session, we're going to make a link, you know, open a new window for your printable receipt, or whatever you want to say for your, your link. And then here's our script for printing. Again, we're going to run session start at the very top. That gives us access to that session. And now we can just say, this order is for customer name, session pizza size, and the toppings. Again, we're going to check if it's an array. Then we're going to run the for each and print out the pizza topping. So even though we didn't collect any of this information, we didn't do anything with it, we stored it in the session, now we have access to it in this script because we ran session start. If we want to do the same thing with cookies, what we need to do, though, is do all of our cookie stuff before we send our headers. So PHP has a built-in function called setCookie. We're going to pass in the name of the cookie and the value we want stored in that cookie. Now our pizza toppings, though, our cookies are going to be just a plain text document. And our pizza toppings is an array. An array requires special formatting. If we just put it in the cookie, it's going to flatten out and not be useful to us. So what we need to do is use a function called serialize. Serialize takes the PHP structure and converts it to a string. And then you can run unserialize on it, and PHP will take the string and convert it back into the nice PHP structure that's usable again. Now, if you have trouble unserializing, hopefully you won't, but there are some server setups where you could run into some issues. So when you unserialize, if it won't unserialize, you might need to run strip slashes because your server may have added some slashes to it, and then that's, prevent, that's escaping the characters and not allowing PHP to unserialize it. So what we can do now is we just access our cookie customer name, so dollar sign underscore cookie all in capital letters instead of session, and then we access the variables just the same way with the square brackets as a super global. Now, we have covered a lot of information here. And before we go into the next session, would you guys like another break? OK, we'll take, um, take a 10-minute break. So come on back in 10 minutes. OK, so what we're going to talk about now is php.net. 
So PHP.net is the official documentation for PHP. And PHP.net is an excellent resource. It's pretty easy to read, has lots of user comments, lots of useful information. So I want to just go over how to use PHP.net. Now, you'll see at the top we have downloads, documentation, get involved, and help. And then we have a search box. The search box, when you start typing in, so let's say we're trying to remember what exactly string length does. So we start typing in, and you'll notice as I type, different functions are popping up below there. So even though I haven't gotten all the way across, you see it pre-fills string length, and I can just come down here and click string length for function. Now, if I'm not looking for the function page, let's say um, I can't remember the name of string length, or how string length is abbreviated, but I know it's something about string length. I can search for string length, and then click here to search for all of php.net. I was hoping the internet would move a little faster. <laughs> so it's not php.net that's slow, it's just the Wi-Fi here. But we're going to get our, our search results. It's going to give us a list of functions and a list of other pages that sort of match up with what we're looking for here. If it keeps going this slow, we'll convert back to my um, screenshots that I did. But actually being able to use the site for you guys is a little bit easier. So you'll see here we have our manual page for string length. Gives you a little of information here. Although I found that these are sometimes really helpful and sometimes not. But you can kind of see string array. Down here, get string length. This page is going to help us out too. Um, this is the multi-byte version. So it gives us some different things. What we can also do is if we know that it's string length, and we just say, for instance, my problem with remembering which one is needle haystack and which ones are haystack needle, if you just need to look that up, you can just go to php.net slash and then the function name, and it's going to take you right to that functions page. Now, the function pages in the manual are very, very helpful. So what we have here are we have a list of the functions in the same section as the function that we're looking at. So these are the other string functions, because string length is one of the string functions. So here you can see we have the full list of string functions in that same section. Over here on the right we have, oh, you know what? I always forget that I have a laser pointer here thing. I don't have to walk in front of the slide. Um, so here we have the title of the function that we're using. If you end up on a page that's not in the language that you can read, you can change the language here. It gives you which versions of, which major versions of PHP it's available in, and a simple description. Then, if you ever notice something wrong on a manual page, I'd like to point out there is a report a bug on every page. Really easy to get feedback back to the core developer. Then we have our description field. This is going to give you a much more detailed description of what this function does. So it's going to tell you it's going to give us an int, String length, we're passing in a string. And that's our parameter. So we are going to return the length of the given string that we passed in. Then we're going to go through, and it's going to give us the actual, let's see if I can scroll down here. There we go. It's going to give us the actual parameters here. So it's going to tell us what we need to pass in for each parameter and what it's going to return. So now here, this is important when you're going to use two equal signs versus three, is to pay attention to these return values. So it's going to give us the length of string on success and zero if the string is empty. So remember that zero could come up with false. Then we have our change log. So if something was working and it's not anymore, check the change log to see if anything new is in the change log. And then this is my favorite part of the documentation. They have actual code examples for you. So they're actually going to use the function a couple different ways to give you some examples of how it works. So here you can see they give us a string length of A, B, C, D, E, F, and then of space A, B, space C, D, space. That way you can see that it counts spaces as a character. Below that are notes fields. This is where you can go if there's any certain gotchas that a lot of people get confused on. They'll put it in the notes section here. For instance, string length returns null when executed on arrays which is important to note. It's not going to give you the length of all the values in the array. 
if this function does kind of what you want but not quite, check the see also section. It's going to give you related functions. So for instance, if you were looking for the length of the array, like how many items were in the array, here it's going to tell you count. String length is not what you're looking for, it's count. And then another awesome section are the user contributed notes. These notes are going to talk about things that other people have run into when dealing with this function, ways that they've solved certain problems with this function. So there's a lot of good information in these user notes as well. If you have solved a problem with this and you want to tell other people, you can add a note over here. You can, add a, um, you can contribute a note to the documentation as well. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to do that. If you have solved a problem, please tell everyone else about it. It's really helpful for everyone if we share this information. So if you do have something that you've figured out, feel free to share a note. And feel free to look through the notes. If something is not working the way you expect it to, chances are that's happened to someone else and they've got a solution in the notes. So very good to check there as well. Other things on here, up at the top, you can see we're in the manual, we're in the function reference, we're under text processing, and we're working on strings. So yeah. if you're looking at a function, you're like, okay, that's kind of what I want, but I want it for arrays instead of strings. Um, you can go back up to text processing and switch to the array section and go on from there. Also, links at the top here go to the previous and next ones, next functions in the list. If we go up here to get involved, this talks about different ways that you can contribute not only to PHP but sort of to the community as well. So it's going to talk about um, you can run test suites, you can help documentation, and you can help with testing. Um, bug reports are a great way to help if you notice something's wrong. Another one that they really need help with is if you speak a different language other than English, they really need help maintaining and translating the documentation files into other languages. I believe they're translated currently into seven or eight other languages right now, and it really is a helpful resource for people in other countries. So if you are able to help with translation, that is a big thing that they need help with. Um, down here at the bottom, you have myphp.net. If you are consistently getting pages in the wrong language, you can come down here and you can set your preferred language. This will tell you what your browser is letting them know that you want, and then you can specify here which of the translations you would like to get. And this is a new thing they're adding here is user group tips. So if you are looking for a user group near you, you can come in and enable user group tips. It's something they're just starting, so as they say, it will likely change a lot and be broken a lot. But what that will do is let you know that when you come to php.net, it might tell you, hey, there's a user group meeting happening near you next week. You know, here's the information for it. So if you'd like to be reminded to go to user groups when you come to php.net, um, you can enable the user group tips here. Any questions on using php.net? Hmm? Okay. There's also a help section. And there's a couple of mailing lists here. So there's a couple different mailing lists. There are, there's an official help mailing list. And they just redid, here it is, okay. So there's announcements if you want to be notified of new versions. Here's the general user list. Now this one is if you have a question about PHP, you can post it to this general users list and someone will try to help you. However, a lot of people ask questions here. So you might not get an answer super quickly, but we try to answer questions as quickly as we can, but everyone is our volunteer. So sometimes things are a little crazy, especially closer to release times. People get a little bit less able to answer questions. But this is a great place to check if you need a question. If you needed an immediate, an immediate answer, though, I recommend popping into IRC and someone directly as opposed to the user list. But if you have some more time, you can post it there. There is a window PHP users, Windows PHP users list as well. So if you're running PHP on Windows and you have some questions, there's a special list for that. There are also lists for specifically installation problems, specifically related to databases, specifically related to Unicode and internationalization, specifically for SOAP. Um, and then there are also language specific lists. Right now we just have Spanish. But if you are interested in starting another language support list, 
um, let them know. But right now there is also a Spanish list if you are interested in receiving PHP help or giving PHP help in Spanish. If you're really interested in what's going on under the hood in PHP, there are the internals list. The internals list is where they discuss what new things are going to be included in core, what new things are not going to be included in core. I will say that if you sign up for these lists, prepare for a little bit of trolling and anger. Um, some of the discussions get very heated on the internals list. But it is a very interesting look into how it goes getting new features included into PHP. Um, there is a git commit list as well. I will say you'll get spammed almost constantly if you sign up for that. And then there's a couple other specific ones like PDO, infrastructure list. So there's a lot of stuff here, lots and lots. Um, so down here at the bottom, you check which ones you want to subscribe to and click subscribe down here. Or you can try sending a message directly to the list that you want through, they use EVLM. this back off my slides here. All right, so I'd like to go through just a couple of quick common problems that happen in PHP. So a common error you might get is parse error, syntax error, unexpected, curly bracket in whatever blah, blah, blah on line seven. Anyone know why? Parentheses, yep. Yep, so we're missing a closing parenthesis right here. So we have two opens and one close. So a very common thing. Now, I will say too, when it says on line seven, now line seven is where the error occurred. That's not necessarily where the problem causing the error is happening. That's where PHP ran into a problem. In this case, it's gonna be on the same line because the opening curly bracket that it doesn't know what to do with is on the same line as our missing parentheses. However, if that had been, some people prefer to put the opening and closing curly brackets in line with the if. In that case, it would have been line eight, but the problem is happening on line seven. So check on the line it gives you and above. How about this one? Parse error, syntax error, unexpected key string expressing comma or semicolon in your path on line 18. Yep, on the first line, we're missing the second double quote. So what's happening here is it's actually going to run into the problem here. So this is gonna be line 18. I should add line numbers to this. Um, but it's actually running into the problem when it gets to this H. Because the, the quoted string starts there, it's going along, and you can have semicolons inside your quoted string. So this echo is gonna be part of your quoted string. Here's where it's gonna close, and then it's gonna be like, what do I do with hi? That doesn't do anything in PHP. So that's where it's complaining. So it's finding, when it says t-string, it's finding unexpected string characters when it's expecting either a comma or a semicolon. So again, like I said, the problem's happening here, but the problem causing it is there. Here's another one. So we have my var equals five. If my var equals 10, echo they match, else echo try again. This will always output they match no matter what you put in. Anyone know why? Yep, that's actually a different problem. <laughs> yep. mm -hmm. Right. Well, thanks for catching my other error. Hang on two seconds. Okay, now what's the problem? <laughs> this is why it's nice to have someone check over your code and why you shouldn't tweak your slides the morning before you talk. Um, so what we're doing here is my var equals 10, and we only use one equal sign. So what that's doing is that's assigning the value of 10, not comparing it to the value of 10. So of course, PHP is always able to assign 10 to that variable, so that's always gonna be true. 
and it will always say they match. One thing that you can do to help avoid that is called Yoda syntax. And I'm mentioning it just in case you run into it, so you'll see why people do that. So you say, instead of saying if my var equals 10, you say if 10 equals my var. So you put the value first and then the variable you're comparing it to. Then what happens is if you do an equal sign there, you're going to get a parse error because 10 is not a valid variable name and you're trying to assign it a value. So if you don't put the variable first, you can use Yoda syntax and it will catch your errors for you. However, I don't recommend relying on Yoda syntax to catch your errors because if you're comparing two variables, that won't, Yoda syntax doesn't help and so on. So it's good to just get in the mindset of double checking your e the number of equal signs. But if you are having a lot of problems with it, you can do this to help remind you. And if you see this, that's why they're doing it. I'm going to cover a little bit of object-oriented programming now. So object-oriented programming builds sort of off the functions that we learned about, and it allows you to create entire classes. Now, the objects that we're creating here, these classes are objects. We had variables that held data. We had functions that held code. Now our object is going to hold both data and code for us. So we use the class key name here, class pizza. And here I have three variables that I'm creating, and I'm making them public. I'll talk about the, uh, the visibility in just a second, but for now I'm making everything public. So those are the three variables that I'm creating. Now when we're talking about object-oriented programming, the variables that I'm creating are called object properties. So we have three properties in this object. Then I'm creating two functions. Inside of an object, these functions are called methods. So these are the object's methods. So it's a little bit different terminology than we're normally used to. So what we're doing is we're creating two functions, a construct and a checkout for our pizza store. Now, you'll notice a construct. It's kind of hard to tell here, but right here we have two um, two underscores. It looks like one long line, but it's actually two underscores. So underscore, underscore, construct. That is a special method that will automatically run when you create a new copy of the object, or as it's called in object-oriented programming, when you instantiate the object. So that will automatically run, as long as you call it underscore, underscore, construct. Then our other method, func or checkout here, that's just one we created. Nothing special about that. That will run whenever we call it. Now, a couple things to note. When we are referencing the properties inside of our methods, you'll notice here we call them this pointer cusp name. Now, this is also called a pointer here, but you'll notice it's a hyphen and then um, a hyphen and a greater than symbol or um, instead of the equal sign. So it's not an array pointer. This is called the object pointer. So it's a hyphen and a right angle bracket or a greater than symbol and then the cusp name. What that refers to is it's saying find the cusp name variable inside of this object. It's kind of a way to think about that. So that's referring to the one inside of the object. This will probably make more sense once we get into an example, but if you do have questions, let me know. When referencing these inside, say, an echo or when we're quoting a string, again, it's kind of like when we're dealing with arrays. You can try to put it just plain, but PHP may have trouble with it, so it's better to explicitly state where it starts and ends, either by doing the curly brackets here or by concatenating them on with the period, the concatenation operator. So here we can say, echo, thank you, this cusp name, you are purchasing this pizza size with the following topping. So what we're kind of doing now is instead of doing it in our script, we are putting that checkout function or their receipt right into our object here. So now what we can do is we can say pizza equal, or my pizza equals new pizza. Remember our class was called pizza. So by saying new, I'm creating a new copy of it or I'm instantiating a copy of it. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a variable, my pizza, that can, again can be called anything you want. I'm passing in the three variables. Now these three variables, because you'll notice when we create class pizza here, we don't have any parameters. But those three variables that we're passing in are going into the constructor. Because remember, the constructor runs when you instantiate a new copy. So those three variables that you're passing into the, into the class 
are going into this constructor function or method here. So name, size, and topic. And what it's going to do is it's going to assign those to the properties of the object. So now what we can do here is we have, I'm passing in best, medium, and my toppings array. Now when I run my pizza pointer checkout, so my pizza, again, relates to the variable that I created, and I'm using the object pointer here. So my pizza pointer checkout is going to run this checkout function. And so it's going to say, thank you, this pointer customer name. So it's going to go up and grab the data from inside this object. So we're storing it. So it's going to say, thank you, Beth. You are purchasing a medium pizza with the following toppings. And it's going to list out the toppings that I chose. I can also access those properties because I made them, because I made them public. I can say echo my pizza pointer cusp name. And that's going to give me the customer name that I chose here, which is Beth. Now what we can do is we can create a number of things. So if, say I ordered four different pizzas, I can assign each of them a different name and so on. And then what I can do is I can, let's say I assign them to my pizza one, two, and three. So I can say echo my pizza one pointer cusp name versus my pizza two pointer cusp name. And it's going to give me those different names because they're stored in that variable. Now you can have classes that are related to other classes or that they extend classes. They're called child classes. And so what we'll just say, let's say we have a class called thin crust because thin crust pizzas require certain information that other types of pizza don't. So we have class thin crust extend pizza. So we say which class it's extending. So that makes thin crust a child of pizza. What happens here now is that the child class is going to have access to the parent class. And it can overwrite things from the parent class. So here, we're defining a, another public. Say if you order a thin crust, you also get to order a side. Whereas if you order a thick crust, you don't get to order a side. So here, we're creating another property called sides. In our constructor, we're passing in the chosen sides. But we also need to pass in the name, size, and toppings that the parent needs. Now, we're assigning this sides to chosen sides. Or, I'm sorry, assigning chosen sides to the property sides. And we need to run the parent constructor to make sure that that runs. And we do that by saying parent colon colon underscore underscore construct. And then pass in those three properties that we need to pass in. Now, we have a function called checkout here. And the parent also has a function called checkout. This function here that's checkout will overwrite the parent's function. If we had named it something else, it would not overwrite the checkout. And we could access the parent's checkout function or whatever functions we have, uh, whatever methods we have. But because we named it the same name, it will overwrite um, the parent's version. So now what we can do is we can say my pizza equals new thin crust. And we're passing in these four parameters here. Now what happens when we call that or when we instantiate the new child class? is it's going to go through, it's going to pass in salad to the child class, and it's going to run the constructor for the parent class and run and assign it best, medium, and topping. Now, we can do my pizza checkout. And this is going to do the child checkout, remember, because we overwrote it. But if we had not overwritten it and we just ran my pizza checkout, it would have run the checkout method in the parent class. So it kind of gives you access to everything in the child class and everything in the parent class. And you can see that here, if we echo my pizza pointer cusp name, which remember is only in the parent class, it will echo out Beth. We talked about storing in cookies and sessions, but if we need a more permanent storage type, we can use a database. I'm going to quickly cover MySQL here. So MySQLi requires uh, MySQL 4.1. And PHP, well, it requires PHP, obviously. But if you're using 5.2.9 or higher, you can use the object-oriented programming format, which is sort of what we just covered. So connecting to the database, what I'm doing on these slides here is I'm going to have the procedural version at, um, the procedural version is down here, and the object-oriented programming way is on top. So the code at the top of the slide and the bottom of the slide are the same. It's just two different ways you can access it, depending on which version of PHP you're using. So we can connect with 
we can create new MySQLi. So that's creating a new object. We're putting it into my connection. So my connection is going to be the variable holding our object. We're passing in the host name, username, password, and database name. And then now we can access things like if there was a connection error. So we say my connection pointer connect error. Now when you go into the documentation for MySQLi, you will see both ways of doing this. And that's why I wanted to sort of briefly cover object-oriented programming, because as you go into some of these libraries on php.net, you will see that they have an object-oriented programming way of doing it and a procedural way. Some of them are dropping the procedural ways onto other pages, so you'll only see the object-oriented programming way, but if you go into the description, you can find a link to get to the procedural way. So we're going to go through here and connect and so on. And as I said, I'm just going to cover this very briefly. But if you have more questions on what I'm going through, please raise your hand and slow me down if I'm going too fast or if you have questions on what's happening. So we can get the result set back. We can run a query and get the result set. If we're doing that object-oriented, it's my connection pointer query. Remember, my connection was the variable we set. So it's whatever variable you've set for your object. And then you just run the query. If you're doing it procedurally, it's my SQLI query, and you have to pass in your connection resource that you created and then run the query. From our result set, we can get the number of rows that we've done, and we can fetch the data. Now, there's a, a bunch of different ways you can fetch the data. I'm only covering fetch associative, which is going to give us the field names and the data from those fields in the database. So I'm going to use a while loop to go through. And what I'm doing is I'm running fetch associative on the, on the result set. And I'm going to assign that to a row variable. That can be called anything you want. I just call it row because it helps me remember that that's one of the rows of data. So now, if I echo in this while loop, I'm getting the title and the author of the book, let's say. So associative is kind of nice because that way you can use the field names so you know what you're getting as opposed to having to know which order they're coming in at. You can also um, do it procedurally here, MySQLi fetch associative, and you pass in the result set. Is the, is the same way as doing the first while loop there, which is the object-oriented way. So if you want to insert data, again, that's, that's just a query. We're going to insert the information. Um, and then with a query, instead of getting the number of rows, you get the affected rows, because the insert actually affected rows in the database. Whereas when you're selecting data, you're not affecting anything in the database, so you just get the number of rows re returned in the result set. Now we talked a little bit about SQL injection attacks, and I wanted to show you an example of one. Um, but before I could kind of show you an example of that, I needed to get, make sure you knew a little bit of the code coming into this. So let's say we have a simple username and password login form. Normally people put in their actual username and password, and we just say, if the username and password match, go ahead and let them log in. But let's say they put in something like a username of attacker. They're never quite that obvious, but you know, let's say they do. And a password of X, single quote, or single quote A equals A. Now what's going to happen with that is, normally we say select star from users where username equals username and password equals password. Okay, that's fine. But if they have used this X or A equals A, that's going to modify our query to say select star from users where username equals attacker and password equals X or A equals A. How often is A going to equal A? Always. Always, right. So they're going to get everything from our database, which is bad. We don't want them to have that. So a couple of different things that you can do to help prevent that is, first of all, if you are using MySQL, you should always be using MySQLi real escape string. What that's going to do is try to escape characters that are going to affect your query. And MySQL real escape string, because you pass in your connection resource or your connection object, it knows what database you're connecting to, and it will do its best to escape everything specifically for the database that you are working with. So it will do its best. Obviously, it's not 100% foolproof, but it is a really, really good start and something you should always be using. You can also do something called prepared statements. Now, prepared statements sort of create a box around those variables that you're passing in so that they can't really affect the rest of the query. So what you do is we're going to create our prepared query. So we use prepare instead of query. And then we pass in what we're doing. And notice we put question marks in where we are going to insert those variables. Um, then what we're going to do is bind the parameters to those question marks. 
So we're passing in comic books from you, Stan Lee, and Siegel in 1999. So what we're doing here is the first parameter goes into the first question mark, second into the second, and so on. So it just goes in order. Then we're going to execute our prepared query, and then we use the prepared query to get the result. So it's a, just a little bit different syntax than what we used previously, but what it does is it sort of takes those and binds up those parameters so that they shouldn't be able to affect the rest of the query. I strongly recommend using prepared statements and bound parameters whenever you are querying a database with information coming in from a user. Um, you can also um, even get so far as um, defining, you can see here I have those same three question marks, and here I've added an extra parameter here. What this is saying is string, string, and um, double. So what I'm doing here is I have this first parameter is a string and so on. So it's even defining what data type we're looking for with that data, uh, with that um, parameter coming in. So you can even get a little bit more specific about what you want to allow into that area as well. There's another library called PDO that you have access to with PHP. This requires PHP 5.1 or greater. So it depends which version of PHP you're using. Now what PDO does is PDO is not MySQL specific, but you need whichever driver is for the database that you're using. So if you're not using MySQL, because MySQL library only works for MySQL. So PDO you can use for a number of different databases. So if you're using Postgres or MSSQL or whatever, you can find the driver for it. There are a lot of drivers out there. So connecting with PDO, what we do is um, I'm just creating some variables up here. So you can see the database info that I'm doing, I'm doing MySQL colon. Now I'm telling PDO that I'm using MySQL. If you were using, say, PostgreSQL, you'd use, you know, PSSQL, PSQL, and so on. So whatever your database is, your driver information will tell you what you need to use in your connection string. I'm telling it the database name that I have, the host that I'm using, the username, and the password. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a try and catch. And I'm going to use DB connection equals new PDO. So I'm creating that new PDO thing. Um, and I have database info, I'm passing my username and password, and I can get my exceptions. And what I'm doing here is I can connect with PDO. Now in the future, if we switch to Postgres, now what I can do is just change this up here to the Postgres tag at the beginning, and my PDO connection information still works. So it sort of abstracts it a little bit for you so that you don't have to change your code if you switch databases necessarily. Some of your queries might need to be updated, but your interaction with the database is now through PDO, and PDO handles specifying that for your specific database. Querying, you'll see we have a DB connection pointer query, and we pass in our query, and we can just do right away as row. So PDO sort of simplifies all of that for you. You don't have to do all of the individual steps. It sort of allows you to do it all in one. And PDO has excellent prepared statements, which is um, my favorite reason for using PDO and encouraging you to use it. So here we have our pre prepared statement. So what we do is we create our query. So we're selecting name and price from products where name like, here you put a colon and then a variable name that you create, or, or like a keyword name, and then price and then there's our price. Now when we prepare the query, when we execute it, we're going to pass in what name equals and what price equals, and then we can fetch the information. So what this is going to allow us to do is to specifically, as I said, bind up that parameter and not allow it to affect other things in our query. So it's not going to allow them to add an A equals A as an OR, because that has to stay all in that one parameter. Again, like I said, it's not 100% foolproof, but it is a much more secure way of doing your queries. <coughs> Here's some more examples of some different prepared statements you can do. Um, you can do the question marks if you'd like. I kind of like doing the names just because it makes it a lot easier to match up what you're assigning to that prepared statement, but you can, if you'd like, just use the question marks. And then when you execute it, you just pass in the values instead of value um, key pointer value. You could also hear too, um, you can see we have question mark and question mark, and we can say the first parameter that I'm binding is phishing, and it should be a string, and we can even say it should be nine characters long. So you can get very specific about what you want to pass in. 
to try to make sure you're getting exactly what you think you should be getting. And again, here, bind our second parameter, and so on. It's the number 20, and we're passing it in as an integer. So you can't even specify the data type, again, with PDO. Um, you can do the same thing with the um, key name, <coughs> excuse me, instead of question mark. So name, fishing, it's our string, or price 20, and it's our integer. let's take a quick look at um, another code sample just to sort of cover the things that we talked about earlier and cover a few new things. So uh, actually, any questions on PDO or MySQLi? I apologize, that was a horrendously brief intro <laughs> to a, a more complicated topic. Um, but I just want to kind of get into the prepared statements. Everyone should use prepared statements. OK. So in this code example here, so we have a phrase. We have PHP is awesome, yay. And I'm setting make upper as a variable, and I'm setting that to true. Now, when we're assigning these variable names, everyone remember, what are the variable naming rules? It has to start with a dollar sign, and then after that has to be a letter or an underscore. Yep, it cannot start with a number but it can include a number. It cannot, however, include hyphens, periods, spaces, quotes, and so on. Um, so here I'm doing the for loop, and I'm assigning my counter here. Here's my condition. n is less than the string length of phrase, and then I'm incrementing n. Now what I'm going to check here is I'm going to check if the phrase is key type alpha. Now what I've done here is notice I'm using phrase like an array. Now if I use phrase like an array, what it's going to do is give me the individual letters as array items. So I can say phrase n. So n starts with 0. So phrase 0 is going to give me the p in PHP. So I'm going to check if it's an alphabetic character. Then I'm going to check if make upper is true or false. Now notice here, I've just said if make upper. I have not put equals true. What this is going to do is the condition is always evaluating whether or not what I've put in that condition is true or false. Because the value of my variable is going to be either true or false, I can just say if make upper. That's going to give me true. So if it's true, well, which P is going to pass as true, then I'm going to say make it uppercase. If make upper is false, then I'm going to make it lowercase. And then I'm going to flip make upper. Make upper. Now, because make upper is either true or false, I can just say make upper equals exclamation mark make upper. And if it's true, the exclamation mark is going to make it false. If it's false, the exclamation mark is going to convert it to true. So the exclamation mark is going to flip it to the opposite. So what I'm going to end up with at the end of all of this is, when I echo our, my phrase, I'm going to get PHP is awesome with every other character, upper and lower case. And notice that it skips the spaces, so capital P, and then it skips flipping that condition until we get to the I, which is another alphabetic character. So it skips the spaces. Any questions on the things we did in this code sample? There we go. OK. Um, so I would love it if you found me and asked me questions as you're getting into PHP. If you have any questions, as I said, this was a really brief whirlwind tour into PHP. You can find me on Twitter. I'm E3BestP. Um, I have my email address on the next slide, so you can contact me by email. Don't forget to find a user group in your area. And if there's not one in your area, I would love to help you start one. Slides are available. And the slides that I use today will be available in probably about 10 minutes, um, depending on how the connection goes <laughs> with the Wi-Fi here. I will get them uploaded for you. Um, but there are some slides up there right now from a previous time that I did that. But the slides won't match exactly. Um, the sample pizza order form that we made is also on there, so you can download the whole code that we created through this thing to get the pizza application going. And then, as I said at the beginning, I work for PHP <coughs> Architects Magazine. Um, we do training and program um, conferences and books and things like that, but the thing that I work on the most is the magazine, and it is the longest-running PHP magazine. 
It's been around for about 12 years now. And I have some sample issues up here if you'd like to come take a look. Um, don't take them because they're my only copies. I do have extras of December and January. I have one copy extra of each of those. Um, but the other ones, please, that's my last copy. So <laughs> don't take them. But please come up and take a look at them. If you are interested in a free issue, let me know. Otherwise, if you have ever thought about writing for a technical magazine, let me know. We would love to help you get published. We have copy editors and technical editors that help go through and edit the articles. So you don't have to be a professional writer. You just have to be interested in the topic you want to write about. And we are interested in articles on all topic levels. So you don't have to be a core developer in PHP to write for us. We have all different levels of readers, and so we have all different levels of articles. So feel free, if you are interested in writing for us, please come and talk to me about that. Um, I would also love some feedback on this talk. Um, Sunshine PHP is using joined in. So if you go to join.in slash 10490, that will take you directly to my talk. Otherwise, if you just go to joined in, the Sunshine PHP is either going to be first or second in the list. Um, I haven't checked this morning, but yesterday it was second in the list. It might be first today. So you can go in there and find my talk and give me some feedback. Or you can email me feedback directly at beth at musketeers.me. And again, as I said, if you ever have any questions, if you're ever struggling with something, chances are I might know the answer, or more likely I'll know who knows the answer, and I can get you hooked up with them. So feel free to find me online as well. Um, my Twitter handle, E3BethP, is also what I use in IRC. Sometimes I'm lazy and just put E3. But otherwise, you can find me in IRC as well um, if you have questions that way. <coughs> Any questions you'd like me to cover? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. So in some very complicated statements, and I apologize, I, I don't know exactly a good use case. I'll have to find out. Um, I was talking to Sarah Goldman, who is one of the core PHP developers and is just insanely smart. And she was explaining to me that the way PHP interprets the word and versus the two ampersands is slightly differently. And I don't fully understand the difference. But in some situations where you get into more complicated phrasing and things like that, or if you're dealing with um, like multi-byte characters and things like that, it can sometimes change how it's doing. David, do you have any examples? Do you know? No, I don't either. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to have Sarah get me an example that I can use in these. But she just said, always make sure you're using the two ampersands. Never use and was her, was her solution to the problem. But there are, I mean, it, it's not going to come up in normal coding. But if you get into something very complicated or if you start dealing with external libraries, it could affect it. I, I wish I had a good example. Uh, yeah, what you think it should do. Yeah, definitely. If you're writing something really complicated, always comment what it's supposed to be doing in case it's not coming out like you think it should. But yeah, um, I'll try to find a, a good example and let you guys know. I'll try to add it into the slides. but. Um, a lot of times when Sarah talks, I'm just sort of like, okay. <laughs> because uh, she's so far deep into internals that um, she knows about all of the extreme once-in-a-lifetime exceptions to the rules. And all of the camp cases that I've ever used and worked just fine. But as a, as a best practice, she recommends the double ampersand. So I do too. Any other questions? I see pointing going on. Did you have a question? No? OK. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. Feel free to come find me. I do have some stickers and stuff up here, as well as business cards, which will have my email address on it if you want to get in touch with me later. Come check out the magazine. And I'm here all week, so come and find me if you think of any other questions. And I hope you like PHP. Thank you. Thank you.